Yeah. His wife, uh, one daughter graduated two years ago, and the other one's they're expected to graduate two more years. So, uh, for the family affair, uh, Doug uh, is also, Doug and his wife are both on the Alumni Council at Shenandoah College, and Doug is also a member of the Board of Trustees. So, if there's anything you'd like to communicate, <laughs> he's your man. Doug received his BS in chemistry in 1982, uh, and then uh, he went to Princeton University on a full tuition scholarship and a teaching assistantship, where he did his PhD work with uh, Lee Allen, one of the leading quantum chemists. Is he still living? No, no. Um, one of the leading chem uh, quantum chemists at the time, and uh, he, he worked on Ab initio molecular orbital studies, say that three times, uh, on metal complexes and organic rings that are strained. Uh, after that, he took a postdoc position with Rutgers University with Ron, Ron Levy and worked on computer simulations of proteins and small molecules and solutions. Some of what he did there is kind of inherited in what, what we'll be talking about today. He worked for six years at Wyeth Air's uh, research pharmaceutical company in Pearl River. I'm telling you all this to give you some notion of the breadth of what a chemist does in a career. Uh, and how old I am, too. And how old I am, too. Oh, yeah. I'm not say that. Because uh, you were one of my students. <laughs> <laughs> That says, we about the same reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in, in, at Wyatt, he worked with chemists, molecular biologists, x ray and NMR spectroscopists with the goal of developing uh, materials in oncology, infectious disease, cardiovascular applications. And since 1997, he has been with Albany Molecular Research Incorporated, Albany, New York. And he is now the section head of the computational chemistry section. Now, to give you a little further idea about the breadth of things that go on, uh, if you take a look at his publication list, you'll see the kind of areas in which he's worked. Of course, he's a chemist, so he's published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. But he's a physical chemist, the right kind. Of right. That's right. So he's published in the Journal of Physical Chemistry, the Journal uh, of the Journal called uh, Chemical Physics, uh, the Journal of Magnetic Resonance. But he's also worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So he's published in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, Biochemistry and Pharmacology, Biochemistry, the Journal of Biochemical uh, Biological Chemistry, the Journal of Molecular Biology, Macromolecules. But he's also working in computers and chemistry, so he's published in the Journal of Chemical Information, Computer Science, the Journal of Computers and Chemistry, and the International Journal of Supercomputer Applications. So this gives you some idea not only of Doug's career, but what scientists actually do in their career, specifically the chemistry here. Uh, and today, he is going to be talking about work that he's been doing at Albany Molecular Research. Here's the title up here, as you can see. It deals with computers and chemistry, computational chemistry. So let's give a warm welcome to ENC alumnus, Professor. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Because my voice might not carry very well. At least everyone who wants to hear me in the back, if you could. <laughs> My good old friend, Scott Turcotte, way in the back. <laughs> um, so uh, every time I come back to ENC, I think of stories. And uh, so I appreciate uh, the invitation to give a, a talk and also the, the warm introduction that Lowell gave. Uh, and it's taken me 30 years to call him Lowell. <laughs> so um, so um, uh, one of the things I was reminded of as I looked at the piles of snow is that in 1978 I was living in Everett, Massachusetts, a senior in high school, and on this Friday, this very Friday, I was walking home from work across Everett, Massachusetts at the beginning of the blizzard of 1978, and um, 
no matter what people say about the snow today, you haven't lived till you lived through the blizzard of 78. So I didn't have any school for the entire month of February in 1978. So that's just one story that I thought about. The other thing was that uh, I should probably tell you my long experience, I do remember this distinctly, the best sleeping seat is right where Lowell Hall is sitting. Uh, that's long experimentation. I tried it in multiple places in this lecture hall, and that is by far the best seat to fall asleep in. Because you have that nice metal thing, and if you, if you keep your hat right there, it just fits snugly. It's, it's beautiful. So, um, no, it was general physics, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> My apologies. So, <laughs> um, and um, that's probably enough for the stories. I have a lot more, most of which would be kind of cynical, but um, uh, and I and I won't I won't share them. And I have about 40 slides, and only maybe 45 minutes that I really want to present them in. And uh, if you want to ask questions during it, just uh, have. I'll just remind you that I tend to give very long answers to very short questions. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you might want to avoid asking a question. I don't know. And I really appreciate your being here today at uh, 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. And I'm going to go all the way to 5.30. Uh, you are definitely loyal and wonderful people. And you deserve a lot of extra credit for being here. And by 5.30, you'll probably deserve a lot more. So, um, so that's my title. We've been having struggles uh, with the technology. This, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's this one? It's not on. Oh, it's not on. Well, that would, it takes an engineer. <laughs> I guess. So. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I've been working in drug discovery research for about 20 years now, 22 years actually. I began actually at the very end of 1991. Um, and I thought I was studying biopolymers and their interactions with water as, as a postdoc, and I thought that was scientifically significant. And, and then somehow that was preparing me to work in drug discovery, but I really took this, the job in drug, drug discovery because I needed a job. And uh, then I realized how little I really knew about almost anything. So um, I studied for, well, since about 1980, starting here at ENC, doing all sorts of calculations on the computer, starting on punch cards and you name it. Um, I've used almost every single computer system around, and uh, I thought I knew a lot. And then I got into drug discovery, and I realized I knew almost nothing. And I was just telling uh, uh, Sherry, Professor, Professor Bird, I'm sorry, <laughs> that, that um, I never took any biology or biochemistry classes at ENC or at Princeton. And uh, I've learned almost all the biochemistry and biology by talking to biologists and biochemists. And so uh, whatever I have accumulated in knowledge is really due in large part to the probably 100 people I've worked with closely over the years and all sorts of other disciplines. And um, so no, no man is an island and especially a computational chemist uh, because all we do is stuff on the computer and really that's not real life. Um, so. Um, well, we try to make it simulate real life. So anyway, now I'll really get into the talk and I'll try to fly through some of this stuff. Um, so I work in drug discovery research. My company does contract research and manufacturing for a lot of pharmaceutical companies. And uh, cost is a huge factor these days in drug discovery and development. And <clears throat> recently it was just estimated that the average new drug costs uh, 3.4 billion dollars to discover and develop and to get all the way through human clinical trials and to get onto the marketplace. And this is uh, a little, oh sorry, I meant to do, ah, this, some of these uh, facts come from a Forbes article 
uh, but it was actually a study done at, at uh, Tufts, and uh, anyway, they're huge costs. Last year, uh, 31 new drugs were put on the market, or allowed on the market by the FDA, and um, a lot of these costs have to do more with the clinical trials than anything else. So once you try to put a new compound into a human being, you usually have to have 10,000 humans willing to take your untested drug, basically. So um, each one of those patients costs a couple of thousand dollars a piece, minimum. Sometimes five, ten thousand dollars. So that's where the billions come in. So our role at, in drug discovery is to make sure that whatever we want to put in the clinic is successful um, in the clinic. Because right now, only about 10% of our tries in the clinical trials are actually successful. So a lot of that several billion dollar cost per drug is because of failure, not because of success. So we try to en engineer the process uh, a little bit better. And um, so that's the, uh, uh, the economics of drug discovery. Um, I wanted to discuss first uh, what I consider a fundamental principle. I've, a lot of people don't talk about it this way, but even in the drug discovery research, people still talk about things like magic bullets, as if there's some sort of magic going on in drugs. But in fact, diseases are caused, uh, diseases that can be treated by pharmaceuticals are caused by malfunctioning proteins, and some proteins are overactive, Sometimes they're inactive, but when we give somebody a pharmaceutical, it's not a magic bullet. It's actually fixing the problem in a reproducible, scientific way. It's interacting with molecular recognition events in the, in the human body, and all the drug actions are determined by reproducible physical, biophysical properties. Um, so there is no magic. There's no miracle drugs. They work for a reason. And so we try to understand what those reasons are and to develop drugs faster, better, cheaper, and to uh, meet major unmet medical needs. So a couple of our, in early drug discovery, what we have to do is to figure out what proteins are responsible for the, the disease. Um, and that's not easy because there are 50,000 or so proteins in the human genome. Actually, I think it's more like 30 to 40,000 now. Um, and, uh, but if you throw in there bacterial and viral genomes, you're well over 50,000 proteins that you could choose to attack. And uh, the other thing is we're chemists, we make molecules, and there's essentially an infinite number of small molecule drugs that could be made and so we have to make sure we test the right ones. And there's very few compounds of all the imaginable compounds that have all the right physical and biological characteristics to make a drug. And just to point that out, there's only 2,500 approved chemical entities as drugs, according to the FDA. That's right, I don't have to actually walk over there, do I? Okay. So um, there's a guy over at Vertex named Derek Lowe, and he's presented um, actually as an ACS um, webinar, so you can look it up. It's on YouTube somewhere. Um, the seven steps to drug discovery, and the first one is to figure out the disease pathology that you're interested in. So every pharmaceutical company tries to decide, are they going to be in cardiovascular research, um, diabetes, uh, cancer, you name it. Um, and then after that you find out what target you want to attack, what protein target. You have to validate that target in some way. Is it really connected to that disease? Or is it just something that uh, is sort of randomly going wrong and it's not really connected to the disease? Um, you then have to set up an assay, a biochemical assay, which is a small, say a hundred microliter size uh, test tube they're really, really small, which there's a lot of engineering that goes into that, and uh, actually trying to record an event in a biochemical test tube that's maybe the size of the tip of your finger, 
uh, even with modern technology, is very difficult to do and hard to reproduce. So there's a lot of tricks to setting up the assays. Then uh, you search some libraries, you get some hits, what we call hits, which are chemical entities that have um, some sort of activity against that assay. And uh, so we might screen a million compounds through this process. And out of that, you might get 10,000 hits. And 10,000 hits is still a lot to look through. So the average project team is maybe 10 or 20 scientists. So even if they, we each chose a couple of hundred, it would take a long time to get through 10,000 hits. So we have processes called hit triage. And uh, <coughs> so we use the computer to sort through and help us make good decisions. Once we've chosen some compounds, it goes into something called hit to lead, which is where we just explore the chemical matter around a certain analog chemistry. Synthetic chemistry is very important in the drug discovery industry. And uh, if any of you like synthetic organic chemistry, let me know. There's a lot of jobs for especially bachelor's level folks in synthetic chemistry because we have to convert these ideas into new synthetic chemistry. Uh, finally, there's lead optimization, which is where you take all the, um, the properties of the compounds that fall out of here, and then you have to figure out what's wrong with them. And it could be that they hit multiple protein targets, and maybe you only want it to hit one. They could be toxic. Uh, they could just be poorly uh, absorbed by the body, or easily metabolized. And then, <clears throat> once you've selected one or two compounds, they go into preclinical development, and this is where the real money starts rolling in. So you start out by spending maybe a million dollars in this process, and then uh, it's billions by the time you get down to the bottom here. Uh, so here, you, you're taking a compound that's only been made in maybe 100 milligram quantities. You have to scale it up to kilogram quantities. And that's risky because you don't even know if you have a drug yet. All you know is you have a compound that's really active. Finally, when a clinical candidate is declared, then the real money starts rolling in, the real risk starts happening, and I'll learn. I'll stop walking in front of the screen at some point. So, um, Drug discovery is a uh, multidisciplinary team. I threw in this little quote that I made up, it takes a village to discover a drug, it really takes a small city. <laughs> Some of you, not, I can tell you're not all that old, but <laughs> back in the 90s, there was a book written, it takes a village to raise a child, well, okay, never mind. <laughs> a few of you got it, great. <laughs> uh, so we try to, uh, I just hit the wrong button, there we go. Okay, we fail early and we fail cheap. That's a common phrase that you'll hear around most labs. And that means you find all your mistakes early on in the process before you invest any money. And uh, so I, I will move faster through these. Uh, some things in um, current drug discovery is the, the primary tactic or tactics is to reduce each organism, human being, into a series of simple measurements. That way you don't have to throw grams of material into a human being. What you do is you take, take apart the human being and you find out what systems are involved and you develop quick and dirty biochemical assays to mimic each one of those steps. And then you hope that they add together. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes the systems are nonlinear or interact in other ways. I'm sure many engineers face those kind of problems all the time. But if you think about the way your body interacts and that your, when you stub your toe, your brain senses it, um, there's a huge amount of interaction taking place in our body. But we can't study that all at one time. We have to break it down into small bite-sized pieces first. Um, I'm going to list, there's a bunch of what for us is now buzzwords, metabolism, that's what our liver does, and actually some of our uh, flora in our intestines, some bacteria is very precious in terms of metabolism. Um, and so our liver 
uh, in the laboratory is converted to liver cells. And so we sometimes do experiments right on liver cells, or also we isolate microsomes, and so they can test metabolism in a lab in a small plate of uh, wells using these smaller systems. Absorption, which is the, the ability of a compound to go from the stomach in the gut and into the plasma, uh, is measured by a couple of other cell techniques, and it goes on and on. So I think I'll keep moving here. Um, what that ends up being is um, a series, a panel of assays through which the compound comes in this direction. We do a series of in vitro assays, then maybe some cell assays, and finally we put it into some small mammals. And so it's a series of, of gates, and every compound has to pass through all the gates. And then on top of this, this other drug-like characteristics that we monitor, and so there's more gates thrown on top of this. This just, just happens to be one simple um, slide. Normally when people present this, it takes two or three different PowerPoint slides to present all the different variations for a given program. Uh, let's see. So, um, uh, this slide was a conceptual slide that I was coming up with in my mind for many, many months, or years even. And then uh, Lowell in his um, uh, chapel talk last homecoming actually presented some of it, but not in this format. So, <laughs> um, so I just thought dimensions of drug discovery sounds kind of cool. So, out at this end, we're human beings. Uh, I'm about two meters tall. And um, my brain, I think, I was trying to do this calculation. I don't know how big my brain really is, but I, I thought the typical organ, maybe some biologists could chime in here, is somewhere in the order of centimeters. And I think our, our skulls are about half a foot. I, I don't know. So maybe it's 20. I don't know. I might be exaggerating that 25 centimeters from my brain. I don't, I don't know. Somebody can do the calculation. Um, cells, though, are another uh, 10,000, one ten thousandth the size of the typical organ. So your heart is the size of your fist. I remember that. And so uh, yeah, I don't, but cells are really small. And uh, viral particles are even smaller. So. Um, somewhere in here, and then, and then you have DNA and proteins, which are typically um, uh, 10 to the minus 8 versus the size of the full organism that's involved. And uh, small molecule drug discovery, we're dealing down here with nanometers in comparison. And uh, as I've often said, you know, most of you have probably heard of nanoscience. In Albany, New York, there's a beautiful nano um, a school of nanoscience actually now. I'd highly recommend it. Um, but actually drug discovery is at the nano-nano level. So those of you who watched Mork and Mindy would get that, but those of you who didn't, uh, I have to explain it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, just to go further with that, small molecules control things that are far bigger than what they actually control an entire organism. So these are three neurotransmitters. And you can see chemically, they're very similar. And uh, they're all about 10 to the minus 9 in size, meters in size. And uh, here's a crystal, uh, well, so these control actually your neurological health, your emotional health, these three compounds. And so this one compound, imipramine, is actually a tricyclic antidepressant. So those of you who look through pharmaceutical books for the fun of it would recognize that name. And um, it's an antidepressant, a very old antidepressant. And here it is uh, crystallized, actually, in, in the dopamine transporter, which is the transporter that controls the flow of uh, dopamine across uh, into your synapse where there are multiple, for each one of these compounds, there are also multiple, up to 15 or so, receptors. So it has three transporters times 15 receptors each. 
And that's how your happiness is controlled. You think it's other things, but really it's the flow of these compounds in your brain. And so it's just little compounds like this, imipramine, which when you read the label, it, it is, it's pretty grim, but it's, on the other hand, it actually is a very successful drug at helping with depression. And uh, so it's a small world after all, I guess. And uh, Okay, so actually, you know what? I don't have a watch or anything. Oh, there we go, five o'clock. We're doing terribly, but we'll, we'll get through this. <laughs> um, so I was telling Scott earlier, this, for those of you who are young, this is one lesson in how to prepare talks. Don't wait to the last minute and then shuffle your slides. So. Um, yeah, I think we've already talked about this. It's uh, drug discovery has certain criteria. Um, so computational chemistry, which is uh, the way we use computers in chemistry, I guess. It couples uh, theoretical chemistry, which is largely just calculus and theoretical physics, with actual application and transforming those equations into computer programs and then using those computer programs to manipulate chemical structures on a computer. So there's a lot of ways that we've used um, um, computational chemistry in my group, but also in, at Wyeth, where I used to work, at literally. Um, and um, so this slide lists a few of those ways. Uh, one of the things that um, is true today, which was not true when I started in the industry, is that almost every pharmaceutical company has millions of compounds stored in very small quantities ready for screening against any kind of enzyme or protein that you might want to look at. And uh, so part of our job as a, as a computational chemist is to uh, store those structures, those chemical structures in such a way that you can always link the chemical structure with the activity. And that's called cheminformatics. Uh, you also um, try to make sure our screening collections will actually produce drug leads and not just active compounds. And uh, part of what we want to also want to do is to be sure that we have diverse chemical structures because while there's an infinite number of chemical structures, once you've tested one in a certain area of chemical space, you don't usually have to test the same area again. So we use a lot of diversity methods uh, but also sometimes we're able to focus our libraries into certain areas of chemical space. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about virtual screening and some 2D methods, but also uh, lead optimization methods which use more quantitative methods. And I'm still walking around for no apparent reason, so sorry about that. <laughs> I'll skip that slide too. Okay, so chemical descriptors. Um, and, and Lowell has been doing this kind of work since the mid-70s, before it was even called chemical descriptors. So um, topological indices are a form of a chemical descriptor, and it's a way to um, transform the pictorial representation, which at least chemists are used to. I've already shown you a couple of typical 2D structures into an array of numbers or bits on a computer. And uh, what you then use those for is to fit experimental data and use standard statistical tools, and sometimes non-standard ways too, I guess. And you can use that to measure the differences between compounds, so if you're looking for diversity, or if you're looking for similarity, how similar are two compounds. Um, and um, one thing recently we've been able to do is when you have a very large, a million compounds in a database, what, uh, how would you sort those? So in Excel, you'd all know how to sort by a number or an al uh, alphabetic character, but how would you sort by a chemical structure? So we've developed ways to sort by chemical structures and to group by chemical structures. <clears throat> so, um, a little principle that is actually obvious once you stop and think about it, but is that similar structures usually have similar biological activity. So if you want a take-home lesson, that's something you can hang your hat on. That 
um, if you look at benzene and toluene, uh, there's only a one methyl group difference. They're very similar in their, their activities. And usually, very diverse structures have very different activities. And that's how, that's among the ways that we use descriptors, these numeric descriptors, to look at compounds. Um, and so, more visually, you would take a structure like this, you calculate various properties like the uh, um, log P, which is the partitioning between octanol and water, which is often used as a surrogate for actually doing the experiment um, of how a drug might partition between the plasma and inside the cell in the cytosol. Um, but other ways, you can just break apart this molecule and you can partition it into different functional groups. And then uh, you can store those as long bit strings. And then if two compounds have identical or nearly identical bit strings, they're probably very similar. And also we do quantitative structure activity relationships and yeah. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that except I'll just, uh, in between, I'll just say that we, we discover a lot of active compounds in, in drug discovery, but, but there's barriers, there's things that get in the way between them and being drugs. And some of those things have to do with reaching the cellular, cellular targets, uh, which includes things like oral absorption. Normally, people want to take drugs as a tablet or something, which means they have to be soluble at pH 2 in your stomach. They also have to be soluble in your gut, which is a little bit higher, which is about pH 8. And they have to be soluble in the plasma at pH 7. If they crystallize out at any one of those spots, you probably don't have a very good drug, and they're not going to reach their target, and they might actually hurt you more than help you. Uh, there's also some proteins that efflux, they pump uh, foreign compounds out of a cell. And they're there for many, many reasons, um, oftentimes mysterious reasons, and um, they're usually ATP controlled. Um, finally, yeah, there are some off-target activities where there are specific proteins that if your compound binds to those compounds, it will kill it as a drug. So herd binding causes pre, uh, QT prolongation, which if you uh, have ever taken Allegra, that is a compound that is not, does not cause P QT prolongation, but a related analog was called Seldane, that did. So it's a, very, it's a very dangerous thing when it happens because you basically die, so. And that's just an allergy medication. So no one really wants you to die just because you have allergies. So we have to avoid these kind of things. And um, I'll just skip along here. Okay, so we do, so QSAR is, uh, involves doing, um, taking an experimental measurement and finding the chemical descriptors that match it. Uh, I'm gonna just gonna quickly go through this blood-brain barrier example which is the ability of a drug to partition between the blood and the brain. So if you have a, a compound that's supposed to affect your CNS, like an antidepressant, normally you need to get that into the brain. And our brain is amazingly uh, put together and it actually keeps a lot of stuff out. Um, just like your, your, your body preserves oxygen in the brain first, it also tries to keep every foreign chemical out of the brain. So there's lots of defenses to getting our drugs into the brain, even though we're trying to help the person. This uh, natural response is to keep it out. So um, this is a, a paper we published uh, probably almost 10 years ago now. And it was a couple of simple models that described um, the log of the blood-brain barrier partitioning to two uh, different descriptors in this case, and then multiple descriptors in this case, uh, and as in deference to some, one of the members in the audience, one of those, well, two of those descriptors, three, those descriptors are electrotopological indices invented 
were first described or implemented by Lowell Hall. And uh, so they're very useful in figuring out, in this case, whether a, a drug might get into the brain or not. And in the case, for example, of allergy medications, their drowsiness, like Benadryl, typically causes drowsiness, it's because it gets into the brain. So compounds like Allegra, um, or Fexafenidine as it's also called, um, doesn't get into the brain. So it doesn't make you drowsy. So. Well, <laughs> so Albany Molecular Research <laughs> uh, owns the patent which is fast expiring this year or next. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, well, I use that example a lot because it's really helped our company a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a loyal person, so. Um, okay, uh, one of the other things we can do with descriptors is set up quick and dirty filters uh, just so that it turns out almost Lipinski's rules is a really simple um, way to define, it's called the rule of five because all these quantities are five. So compounds that have higher than 500 molecular weight, their log P is greater than five, they have too many hydrogen bond acceptors or the too many heteroatoms, they tend not to be good drugs. So this is a really simple filter. And again, um, yeah, we'll keep moving. Um, really, my aim was to talk more about this part of the talk, so uh, anyway. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, structure guided design is what I'm now calling this, but originally, if you look in the literature, maybe chemical and engineering news, you'll see the terminology structure-based design. Um, I keep lightening it because as long as I've worked in the field, uh, I've really never designed a drug off the bat using a protein structure. And uh, so I use protein structures to guide me and they help me with drug discovery, but they really aren't a design in terms of engineering. Engineers always are offended after I've talked about this because it's not designed at all. Um, and uh, what we do is we look for, um, uh, let's see, we start with some binding experiments um, and we iterate through, we crystallize proteins with these ligands. I'll talk a li very little bit about that. And then we use computations to predict protein ligand interactions. And by the way, it, it's confusing, but a ligand is a term in drug discovery which is used in a very different way. That means a chemical compound, and it's not the ligand that sits on a metal. So those of you who've taken inorganic chemistry, we're not talking about iron nitrile complexes or anything. It's, it, these are ordinary organic chemicals. Um, and I don't know why that changed, it just, uh, I think it's because there are a lot of biologists that work in the field and, and I think ligand, ligand, and it's usually called ligand, is a more common term in biology than chemistry to describe this. Um, there are a number of experimental methods to uh, measure the interaction, the binding of a compound to a protein. Uh, I really like isothermal titration calorimetry. Um, they're fairly inexpensive machines, about $100,000, but they give you the free energy of the binding of a small molecule to a, a protein. Um, you can also use NMR to, to study this, even with fairly mediocre NMRs, uh, because all you're looking for is the change in the chemical shift once you've introduced a small molecule compound. Um, indirect methods are, say, uh, uh, biochemical evaluation, using an enzymology test, for example, and you can measure the inhibition constant, which is actually not a direct measure of the binding, but it's pretty close, or the inhibitory concentration that gives you 50% inhibition. The concentration at which the inhibition of an enzyme's activity is 50%. But anyway, uh, you can also use radial ligands, those are becoming less favorable because you have to dispose of all the waste product afterwards. 
And then uh, the most common thing now is to attach some sort of fluorescence tag to a compound, and then um, you can test the binding by measuring fluorescence transfer. Ah, okay, so, 3D, so in order to do structure-guided design, we need, to do, um, we need to get the 3D coordinates of a protein and of a ligand, and that's where things like X-ray crystallography come in, which is uh, the direct observation of the electron density. It's mostly the solid state, but, uh, and you don't see any of the fluid atoms. Uh, protein NMR is nice because it's the solution structure. The problem is you have to tend, you tend to have to do it at very high or very low pH, I'm sorry. And you get indirect measurements of the structure. So then you have to fit that back to um, an actual Cartesian coordinate system. And something that we use a lot is homology modeling, which is actually purely a computational technique. So when you have the 3D structure of an already crystallized protein, and uh, it's 20% identical or more to your, your target protein, you can build a model from that. And it's important to remember both of these experimental methods are models of experimental data. And so then homology modeling then becomes model, a model of a model or a model from a model. So um, that's very useful. And then what we try to do on the, in computational chemistry is to calculate the association constants of proteins and ligands. And um, it would be wonderful if we could do that. That would make drug discovery so much more efficient in the early stages. Um, but these numbers are nearly impossible to get on a computer. And uh, I think if I didn't shuffle, oh yeah, yeah, I didn't shuffle them too badly. I was, I was concerned I was randomizing my slides at one point. So, um, <laughs> So this is the, uh, the issue that you have to deal with if you're trying to do those simulations. Um, you need to do your ligand, your small molecule, in a huge box of water molecules. And you can see that here. And then this is a little up close. And then you have to do the protein um, and ligand uh, sort of co-crystallized here. So here you have the complex and you also have to coat it with water. And um, actually, you know, an aqueous is, is a simplification too. You have to get the ionic strength correct in each box of water that you're dealing with. And so there are tens of thousands of, atom, tens of, thousands of atoms, and you have to get the potential energy of each of those atoms correctly, and of all, all the interactions. And um, you have to get lots and lots of uh, geometries to get the statistical thermodynamics correct. So, um, uh, if you look in a typical stat MAC book, it looks very simple for ideal gases. And even Bill Belichick can now explain <laughs> ideal gases. <laughs> I was trying really hard to work at that in today. So, um, uh, so this is nothing like an ideal gas. So the thermodynamics here is very complicated. Um, but to get potential energies, um, this, this is for the physicists here, uh, both of them. <laughs> You'll never invite me back, right? <laughs> um, so this is what I got my PhD in, in theoretical chemistry, is this, Thing. It's the Schrodinger equation and, and um, gas phase small molecule calculations. And I didn't quite get the process arrows all in here, but there's a series of approximations running through here. And um, so one of the ones that I think most chemists would have heard about by the time they maybe get to grad school is molecular orbital, uh, man, it's been a long time, linear combination of atomic orbitals method. And um, uh, MO, you, uh, I asked this bonus question. It's really not a question, but a challenge. To name all the Nobel Prize winners on this, that are represented on this slide. And uh, Schrodinger, of course, is one. And I checked with John Free, Born and Oppenheimer, both got a Nobel Prize. This one is uh, uh, molecular orbital, but people often call it Mulliken orbitals. So Mulliken got a Nobel Prize. 
Um, <clears throat> Density functional theory, that Nobel Prize was just given in the last few years to a couple of folks. You can look that up. And um, um, also the standard methods that I learned in grad school was uh, something called Gaussian, because we use Gaussian um, orbitals on our, all our calculations. And that person, the author of Gaussian, got a Nobel Prize recently. So all those, I put a few numbers here, it's really super expensive. It goes as n to the sixth, where n is the number of electrons in the system, and really then it gets even more complicated because it's the number of orbitals in the system factors in as well. So these are essentially, if you took that box of water, it is impossible to solve at, at these um, wonderfully accurate methods. So, Molecular mechanics was kind of invented in the early 70s. Uh, also, the last Nobel Prize in chemistry went to three, three different scientists here. Um, and uh, molecular mechanics is a really a fundamental part of our work in computational chemistry in drug discovery because it allows us to do free energy calculations on systems of the dimensions on the previous slide. So, tens of thousands of atoms in millions of geometries. And uh, it still actually scales pretty badly. It's still about the square of the number of atoms. Yeah. Well. Hartree actually solved the molecular, the atomic Model yes. On a mechanical <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just your mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, and actually the first molecular dynamics simulation was done with literally hard spheres in the 1930s with ball bearings on a board or something. And they just tracked it with lead or with uh, graphite on the ball bearings to see how things went. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here are some more buzzwords if you're interested. Uh, minimization is, a, um, is an attempt to hit zero Kelvin, basically. Uh, it, re it eliminates all uh, forces from the system. But really, to get free energy, you have to do simulation methods like molecular dynamics, which is simply a classical solution to um, the, the uh, atomic motion and molecular motion. And um, so we toss out all the quantum mechanics at this level. There's also some ways to do it with Monte Carlo where you just randomly rotate um, especially torsional um, um, bonds in a, in a torsional way. Um, but there's, the quantum mechanics has to be factored back in in some average ways into molecular mechanics. Um, one thing that we do a lot is just simply docking of, of compounds into a rigid protein. So there are ways to further take molecular mechanics, simplify it even one further step, and then this becomes a very fast process, about 15 seconds per compound, at least on our computers. And you could probably buy computers that would do it a second a compound. So that, now you can do a million compounds on multiple processors in maybe a matter of days. So you can do a virtual screen, what we call a virtual screen, instead of doing biochemical screens with some limitations on accuracy, which I won't get into, but there, there are plenty of limitations there. Um, and I'm just going to go through this. So we have to have really fast scoring functions for docking. And um, some of those uh, reflect uh, what is uh, Van der Waals equations and um, so each atom in the system is represented by uh, a sphere size, a radius, and an energy of interaction with other atoms and, um, and also uh, one of the major driving forces is simple electrostatics and that's just ordinary columbic electrostatics. So what we have to do to get these things to work is to guess what the partial charges should be on an atom. 
but partial charges are not quantum mechanical observables, so therefore they don't actually exist. So we parameterize those things, and, um, and amongst the uh, uh, other things, I'm, I'm sorry, John, I should have made that bigger, right? <laughs> I, could, I could see him staring at that equation. Did he get it right? And um, in there is the uh, dielectric constant, which there is a dielectric constant, which is constant, but in our systems, the dielectric of the system is not a constant. So it's an average property of the system. So that's another parameter we can play with to get the charges in the electrostatics to all work out. And amazingly enough, after all the approximations, actually, this actually will work. If you do a virtual screen, you can often come up with a 10% hit rate on compounds after you actually test them in the lab. And if you were to look at it randomly, you might expect at most a 1% hit rate. That's a typical high throughput screen in a biochemical assay. So we're able to get a factor of 10 enrichment oftentimes. Uh, okay, so here are some other interesting interactions. I'm gonna skip through these pretty quickly, but these are things that don't come, um, hydrogen bonds come out of simple electrostatics. There's also some other interesting things. If you look at a, a benzene ring, there's a pi cloud over here. If there were a hydrogen pointing at it, there's a favorable distribution of where that hydrogen should be because there's this small interaction between a hydrogen atom and its charge and that uh, potent pi cloud sitting over a, a benzene ring. And uh, it, that's additionally even, even stronger when you look at a basic amine, an ordinary primary or secondary amine, sitting over a pi cloud, there's a really strong interaction there, which is somewhat unexpected, but typically in proteins, these interactions are in very low dielectric media, so that coulombic term is much higher. So in water, uh, aqueous water, which has a dielectric of 80, it's not very potent, but when you put it in a protein, it's very potent. Um, let's see, virtual screening, I already talked some about that. Okay, protein kinases. Yeah, this is what I really was trying to get to. Um, protein kinases are, I'm gonna give you an example that I started on in 1993. And um, remember that, that date, sort of. It's really not that important, but it makes the story a little bit better. Uh, protein kinases are enzymes that transfer phosphate from ATP to some protein, some other protein. There are uh, 750 protein kinase domains in the human genome, and they're all about 200, the, each domain is about 250 amino acids in length, 200, 250. And uh, protein kinase domains are also found in receptors, so there's other parts of the protein. It just happens that w the important signaling happens at the protein kinase domain. And uh, so th these 750 protein kinases were arranged in what somebody called a kinome. So you've all heard of the genome. If you fish around in the drug discovery literature today, you'll hear about the biome, the genome, the proteome, the interactome. Well, this is the kinome. This is the kinases and how they're related. So this plot shows the, the um, amino acid similarity in a dendrogram. And so there's families of protein kinases all over the place. And the, these, this group is all closer to each other in sequence than it is to this group over here. Um, because kinases are so important in signaling in our cells, they're, um, hmm. I might be five slides ahead, Matt. Let's see. Well, I will. Uh, <laughs> Did you guys put a time limit on this? <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah. It's frozen again, huh? Frozen again. You have the record of frozen screen in one day. See, I'm trying to hear what is it doing. Wow. Wow. I'm going to forget how to put it back on again. So we can, we can really hit. No, no, this is, even this is frozen. Escape doesn't work. <coughs> Oh, oh, well, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the blue screen of death. Boy, I haven't seen that in a long time. We're having a, a dumping physical memory to disk right now. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go with a chalk ch talk from now. <laughs> wow. So um, I'll try to remember that I'll, I'll get through three or four slides in the, the meantime. Um, we're restarting. <laughs> so uh, protein kinases are really important in, in cell signaling and therefore they're often in cancer cells they're upregulated so you get a lot more of them or you maybe get a lot less of a particular kinase. And um, so the, the story I'm going to tell you about is something called EGFR, which is uh, endothelial growth factor receptor. And we were interested in the kinase domain of this particular protein. And in a lot of head, neck, lung cancers, and a few others, it's overexpressed. And so back in the early 90s, it was determined that this might be, might be a good target for cancer treatments. So, uh, so uh, one company called Park Davis published their uh, best compound, and it's uh, quinazoline, and uh, has various substitutions on it, and it's, uh, it was very, very potent, so we were very excited about it. So we set up an EGFR kinase screen, and um, from there, we were able to identify what we thought was a particularly interesting cysteine residue in our EGF model. And um, so this cysteine, uh, cysteines have a, a, a bare sulfhydryl group on them, which is fairly reactive. So we put a microacceptor on our compound and um, it'll all be clear once I get this slide up here. Uh, we put a microacceptor on it in order to react with the cysteine. And um, the, okay, I should be able to go full screen from here. Ah, there we go. So, um, based on, uh, on that, so this was the lead compound. We put a microacceptor here. It was intended to react with a cysteine. And uh, we designed this compound on a silicon graphics workstation, um, which might not mean a lot to you, but you, uh, they made wonderful heaters when you were done with them. Um, they, they had gold fittings. They were, they were wonderful looking machines. And they weighed about 200 pounds. And, uh, but that was a state of the art in 1993. And I think my phone would beat it at almost anything I, I could do now. Uh, the mechanism was covalent irreversible inhibition of EGFR. And we saw in a kinase assay that it was extremely potent. And irreversible, we got nanomolar, uh, so that's 10 to the minus 9 molar concentrations. We're able to inhibit growth in several cancer cell lines. And we put it in a, a nude mouse model where you can inject actually um, tumors uh, because they don't react with the, the mice have almost no immune system left. So you can stick almost any kind of disease in them. And uh, it's very handy to measure and monitor tumor size. 
because um, they have no fur. So uh, it was an effective compound even at that dose. And, um, and then I left the company in 1997, and uh, this compound was still floating around. I had no idea what happened to it. But over the years, other companies have taken up um, EGFR kinase inhibitors, and um, including, well, I wor was working for Letterly at the time. It became Wyeth Ayers Research. It's now Pfizer. And uh, so this is the latest Pfizer compound down here. You can see um, that um, uh, this, this little invention here, we got rid of a nitrogen from the quinazolin ring and we're able to put a nitri nitrile there. Um, and here it is bound and it turns out, uh, I think this is missing a double bond here, but anyway it reacts with the exact cysteine that we predicted it would and, um, and so the ERISA, which is a more successful compound, is somewhat more um, reversible and uh, it's also been crystallized with EGFR. So now 20 years later I found out that in fact what we did on archaic computers in 1993 was actually uh, correct. And um, just to show you a couple of other uh, examples of this, so this has been a crystal structure published of this compound, which clearly has the double bond. It reacts with the cysteine, which is cysteine 797, and it forms that bond with the protein, and it's irreversible. Now, there's still problems, though, with EGFR kinase inhibitors because um, uh, cancers are heterogeneous. That is, they have multiple mutations. In this case, uh, EGFR-dependent cancers also typically have a, at least one mutant that inhibits or doesn't allow the binding of these compounds. So that's one of the struggles that we face. Uh, you can win, but then ultimately the patient isn't entirely cured from, from the, the new drugs. Um, and you also... Uh, I never thought I would hear this, but I was watching football one day, and I saw an ad for this new, uh, sorry about that, new compound called Zelljans, which is a rheumatoid arthritis compound. And if you listen carefully to the ads, they actually say it's a JAK3 inhibitor. And when they say that, they mean Janus kinase. And um, what's kind of cool is that they're marketing a structured, guided, designed drug to the pub, to the football watching public of all things, so, <laughs> and um, and you can look up um, these structures on the RCSB. That's the repository for protein structures, and there's all sorts of fun things you can do with protein structures now on the web. And um, I am going to end. There's another kinase story that we continue to MRI. But I'm going to just leave it there because the computer will probably crash again. Thank you for your uh, time and patience. Um, I enjoyed it. So. Anybody have a quick question to which you can give a quick answer? Anybody have a question? Well, if not, that will be around for a while. Uh, asking questions or about